today we are telling one of those stories that is impossible to believe, but because of faith, we know that they are true. So if you have ears to listen, listen to the word inspired by God for us, the children of God. Today our lesson, our legend, has a name, Deborah. The title of our lesson is called At the Hands of a Woman. For some of you, that will be dangerous. For others, it will be a celebration. Our scripture for the lesson is taken from Judges 4, verses 1 to 10, reading now from the New Living Translation. After Ehud's dead, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Asar, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagahim. Sisera, who had 90 hundred iron chariots, rutlessly, rutlessly, wait, that's not right. How do you say that word? Ruth, that's right, ruthlessly, oh, I'm going to butcher that one. Oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. You know, as I'm talking about this, and you have these big words, obviously not in English, but in the Bible. Have you ever been in charge of reading the Bible in public? Know this recommendation from your pastor, whose language, English is not my first language. In the Bible, every single name is phonetical. So the way that it looks is the way it should sound. It doesn't have rules like English where K is silent in words like knife. That's just not it. This makes sense. Whatever you see is whatever you read. So if you're ever reading in public, remember that the names of the Bible are phonetical. Anyway, let us continue verse 3. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day, she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, This is what the Lord the God of Israel commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Sebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera. This is God speaking. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied. I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture. For the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the, say it with me, at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Sebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. The word inspired by God for us, the children of God. Thanks be God. Deborah, at the hands of a woman. This is going to be a fun sermon to preach. I promise you that. This is why, what's happening to Deborah and Barak, this is why we can have nice things. Have you heard that before? After Ehud's death, which is the, pro, the judge that we talked about last Sunday, Israel enjoyed 80 years of good relationship with God. 80 good years. Sadly, when Ehud's dead, the Israelites 
do what most people do. They fall back to their old ways. No different than when you have a child or a teenager, actually, and you say, why did you do that? And they're just staring at you. I don't know. Why? We just talked about this. After Ehud's death, Israel didn't know what to do. So they went back to their evil ways. Deborah, a prophet and a judge. Deborah is a legend. She's one of the only women who is a judge. And not only she's a judge, but she is a prophet. And not only she's a judge before being a judge, but she is the one that says ruling when two Israelites were having problems. Deborah is more equipped and more talented than any other judge. She's a prophet. Do you remember what a prophet is? A prophet is that person who God gives information to share to the people of Israel. And not only that, but Deborah is actually a real judge where she is giving judgment, verdict, between two people or more who were having problems. People would actually know that Deborah was so smart and could have so much wisdom from God that they will go to seek encouragement, clarification, and a decision that was just. Church, let me tell you, do I love that God is loving? Oh, yes. Do I find encouragement that God is merciful? Absolutely. But the thing that I love the most about God, above all things, is that God is just. And as God is my witness, God is just. That is my favorite thing from God. That I know that he is just. And the people of God knew the same thing about Deborah. So they will come to meet her. And not only that, she'll be on time to cook dinner at night. And I say that is because for whatever reason, the author of the book of Judges, not happy saying that she was a judge and a prophet, she, he had to say, Deborah is the wife of Lapidoth. I didn't like that. I promise you. It bothered me. What's the point? If you tell me that she's a prophet and a judge, what's the point of you telling me that she's the wife? I don't like that. Being raised by a strong woman, I don't like when the wife has to be the wife of somebody to have importance. I don't like that. It bothers me. So I started digging in Hebrew. And I found out that Lapidoth was not only a name, but also a title. The title of the light. The woman, the woman married to the light. The woman of torches. When you're in a dark place and you are in a struggle and you're in a nightmare and someone is able to bring the light what does that mean to you? Salvation, encouragement, peace. So, in Hebrew, I can understand that when the author says, Deborah, the wife of, not necessarily means that she was the spouse of somebody, but that she was married to the light, to justice and peace. Oh, that was so good to read. Deborah, the prophet and the judge, before becoming a judge, before liberating Israel. One day, Deborah, say it with me, the prophet and judge. One day she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in the land of Kadesh, of Naphtali. She, as a prophet and said to him, this is what the Lord of Israel 
commands you. Go into Naphtali, gather 10,000 troops, and march. That's a paraphrase. Then God, verse 7, God will call Sisera, which is the oppressor of the people of Israel, and there God will give you victory over Sisera. What does Barak do? Oh, yes, I will do that right now. No, he doesn't do that. If you ask me, this general of the army of Israel is a weak character and spirit, a coward. If you ask me, he says, I will go, but only if you go with me. Really? You are the general in charge of commanding 10,000 troops, and you want someone to go with you to do what this prophet and judge wants you to do. Really? Barak? So what happens to him? consequences church remember that god not only punishes because he loves us not only disciplines because he loves us but god allows consequences to happen to us because of our choices or the lack thereof you know a, a while back in one of my favorite sim, uh, tv series from a while back talking about early 2000s I love the show called Sopranos, which is it's a show that talks about a mafia in upstate New York or New Jersey, whatever. And it talks about the challenges of a mafia boss with mental illness. And I love this show. And if you think that that is weird, that a pastor likes mafia movie violence stuff, you haven't read the Bible. Because if you continue reading a few verses later in verse 21, you will see this woman named Jael. Jael. And Jael sees Cicero running away from the fight. And he hides in her tent. And he says, hey, hey, if anybody comes looking for me, tell them nobody's here. But I'm thirsty. Give me some water, woman. I oh, will give you some water. She took a jar of milk and gave it to him. Now, have many of you drink milk straight from the cow? No? It is thick. Thicker than thick. And he puts you to sleep really quick. So she gives him a whole load of stuff. And he drinks and falls asleep. And when he's sleeping, you know what she does? She takes a peck. Grabs her tool and carefully decides, and bam! Kills him on the spot. Why? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Violence? Oh, the Bible is full of violence. But something that teaches you something. We don't have time. We make time for the right things. When we first were approached to do one funeral on September 25th, we said, yes, of course. When we were approached for a second service, we said, oh, yeah, we will put one in the morning and one in the afternoon. When we were approached to do a third funeral, on the same day, you know what we said? Yes. Because it's you who have empowered your staff and your pastor to do wonderful things. Where we have a whole campus where we can accommodate the needs of the people of God for the celebration and the honor of God in honor of our loved ones. You know how difficult it is to tell someone uh, sorry, your family member died, but we're already busy that day, so can we do it on Sunday or the Saturday after? You know how difficult that is? And you know how good it is to be able to say, yes, we will because we can. How? Don't you worry. We got this. The whole staff says, 
we got this. So we were taking every port to be united with what we have. We took our pecs and our hammers and says, hey, we're going to make it work. This is sufficient, and this is what happens. Church, so many times we are provided with things, things of value. But at first, they don't seem like much. I have this sculpture of Jesus that I've been talking and using all morning with you. I gather it from a gentleman that I met in one of my trips to Cuba. I found this sculpture of Jesus in the trash. He says, oh, it's not good enough. The hands and the feet broke off. I could get a really good detail of the face, but the body was broken, and I couldn't get it to work. And then he proceeded to say that the way he finds wood in Cuba is that he has to wait at the shore for wood to come to shore so he can do his carvings. Why? Because there is no wood in Cuba for him to do his trade. And I look at the trash that he had, and if you look at his trash at that time, well, actually, you don't have to go to Cuba to see it. You can go to my office and look at this man's trash. These sculptures are all over my office, little, small, and big. There were so many good things that he did, and he says, oh, they're not good enough. And they are like, they're excellent. What are you talking about? This is a wonderful thing. Let me take them. Let me buy them from you. He says, no, that's trash. You can't buy that. Oh, you don't even know. You don't even know. Which reminds me also of David Ayers. What you see behind the Jesus is figurines that were bought in Israel by David's wife. Who, he, who she brought a long time ago, and the church continues to use it every single season of Advent. And I said, I don't have to wait until Advent. I'm the pastor. I can do it. I will make it into the sermon. You will see. And behind that, you will see a guitar that was molded and used for worship. And what you see behind that is flowers to honor God. And what you see behind that is a building, a church that is 130 year, 137 years old to be used as an instrument. Why? Because as Christians, we are to use what we have. Not what we wish, but what we have. God makes what we have enough. And you, my friends, you have gifts and talents and treasure that are necessary. You can only and should only trust and bring it forward and watch God do the rest. Many of you have pecs and hammers. And I'm telling you, that is enough in the eyes of God if you only trust him. My friends. Our commitment is to trust that we are enough the way we are. We need to take the challenge to use them. All of you have gifts and talents that are going unused right now. Bring them forth. Bring them for the glory of God. Amen.